Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started, even though I'm sure they will, will have stragglers coming in. Um, I am Arnold Hirschon, Vice Provost and Un Minsith Family University Librarian. I am pleased to welcome you to today's program, which is part of our 25th anniversary of the Kelvin Smith Library. Uh, before I introduce um, today's speaker, I'd like to discuss a few of the reasons why the questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion are so es such an essential part of this celebration and the work of libraries. Around three years ago, um, the four campus library directors, um, Jessica DeCaro from Health Sciences, Joe Custer from the Law Library, and Sam Skutnik, all I'm pleased to say are here, from uh, MSAS Library, we got together and began a collaborative process to identify and define shared strategic directions. And very high on our list was the establishment of a working group to address um, DEI issues amongst our, that were shared amongst our libraries. So since its formation, a number of staff have served on the diversity working group. And I'd like to ask that any of those members uh, current or past or here, if you just kind of like wave to the crowd and be recognized. So we thank you for your work. Um, the working group has had an adm admirable record of activity and success since it started. Uh, the first thing they proposed um, and that the library directors approved was a library diversity statement, which I'll read. The Case Western Reserve University libraries are deeply committed to achieving racial justice and promoting a culture of anti-racism, inclusion, equity, and diversity so that all people are welcome, heard, empowered, and valued. To implement this vision statement, the working group uh, then began to define uh, efforts in three areas. The first was the internal culture of the libraries. Over the past two years, the working group has conducted numerous DEI educational programming with their staff. Uh, many of those sessions have been provided by the um, Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of the University, uh, VP Rob uh, Solomon is here. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and those training sessions have covered a range of topics, including uh, implicit biases, microaggressions, deconstructing privilege. Um, there were roundtable conversations about uh, truth be told, culture and power. And this is a continuous effort. It will probably never end. Uh, new sessions are planned for safe zone training. And uh, the group also created a diversity bulletin board, uh, a, a lib guide for library staff that highlights articles, books, multimedia, and events centered around topics of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Their second area of act activity was library collections initiative to assess and improve the diversity of our library collections and resources. They developed a diversity framework to assess the collections uh, that we currently hold. And based upon that, two efforts are being undertaken. One is in collaboration with Ohio Link to purchase materials to close gaps uh, in our collections. And I'm also pleased to announce that this year KSL is committing uh, special funding to the acquisition of diverse content that may fall outside of what we obtained through Ohio Link. Um, in addition to these related to collections initiative, another activity of the group was the mounting of a digital exhibit around student activism at Case Western Reserve, including pages about women's suffrage and a new ex exhibit they're preparing for release by the end of the fall semester regarding the abolitionist movement. The third priority identified by the group that they've been working on is what they're calling the spaces initiatives to assess our facilities and identify potential improvements to make the, the facilities of all the libraries more inclusive and welcoming. Uh, they've already distributed and analyzed the results of a survey of the library staff to gain staff perspectives and ideas. And they're about to launch a student survey. And once all that information is on hand, they'll be making specific and comprehensive recommendations to the campus library directors regarding each of our libraries. 
In addition to the um, great this great work by the working group, I also want to highlight that KSL recently posted a new position for a liver library diversity fellowship. This will be a three-year position, flexibly constructed. Uh, to foster and support the growth and development of new librarians and archivists from historically underrepresented groups. The fellowship is aimed at recent library graduates to help them develop their skills and competencies in their own areas of interest and do so within a fostering environment. The fellow will be a full participant in the regular duties and all the work of the libraries, including our special project. While this record of success in such a short period of time is impressive, we know that this work is never ending. And so today we invited as part of this series a recognized expert in the field so she can lend her expertise, discuss her experiences, and inspire us to identify and pursue additional opportunities. And so we move on to my introduction of our speaker, Elaine Westbrooks, started her career as a Latin American cataloger and digital research librarian at the University of Pittsburgh, and her career has flourished ever since. Elaine has held a variety of leadership positions over the course of her career, including eight years at Cornell University. These, she was the associate dean of library operations at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and um, she served as, for three years as associate university librarian for research at the University of Michigan before she moved in 2017 to become the vice provost for university libraries and university librarian at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she leads a library system that includes 10 libraries that is staffed by 300 librarians, archivists, and staff. Beyond her work assignments, she has also presented her research at many important conferences, including the Digital Library Federation, Coalition for Networked Information, the Association of College Research Libraries. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's also a published author and a member of multiple committees of the Association of Research Libraries, and she has served on the boards of the Digital Public Library of America and the Hathi Trust. In addition, she is on the governing board of the Triangle Research Libraries Network, the oldest academic library consortium in the United States, whose members include not only University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, but also Duke University, North Carolina State University, and North Carolina <coughs> Central University. Relevant to today's presentation, one of the guiding principles of TRLN is to pursue, quote, the goal of dismantling racial injustice and inequity in research libraries by considering issues of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. As a leading voice in the library profession, Elaine is frequently asked to speak and be interviewed by national media on the leadership and transformation of the scholarly communication system of libraries and how to best include and make diverse and equitable the access to libraries. Elaine speaks with the courage of her convictions, for which I greatly admire her. When a few months ago, the distinguished journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones was initially denied tenure at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a course that the Board of Trustees had to reverse but too late. In the aftermath, Elaine spoke out eloquently, stating that, quote, although this issue is largely resolved, its causes remain and I am no less appalled. I will always speak out about injustice, especially when it touches on our work and our community. She went on by saying she was deeply concerned about the subjugation of academic freedom and faculty governance that this episode revealed. When racism fuels the exercise of political power to stifle inequity, uh, inquiry and academic freedom, we should all be concerned, and libraries especially so. As library workers, we are professionally committed um, to the open exchange of ideas and the mission of academia to ask uncomfortable questions, to train critical thinkers, and serve as a platform for growth and discovery. These efforts are our own. In the wake of such a tumultuous and disheartening process, my commitment to building a just organization has never been stronger, she said. The work of reckoning is fundamental to our realizing our potential as a library, as an employer, and as a cornerstone to the UNC Chapel Hill community. 
We certainly cannot stop now when there is clearly a long way to go. So finally, on a less serious note, I would also like to point out that I'm glad that we could have Elaine here today so she could uh, check off one more thing on her bucket list. Elaine received her uh, BA in linguistics and her MLS uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. She's traveled through um, Cleveland multiple times. And even though she worked for three years in Ann Arbor, Elaine wrote to me this past weekend, she said, surprisingly, I've never been on the campus of Case Western Reserve University. So Elaine, not just for your sake, but more importantly for ours, I'm so delighted that you've made um, this trip so that we can make this dream a reality for you. And it is great pleasure that I welcome you to the podium, my friend and colleague, Elaine Westbrooks. Wow. Um, thank you, Arnold, for that charitable introduction. I think you, <laughs> I think you added a few things there. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, and Arnold's right. I can't believe I've never been on this campus. As you could probably tell, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, and um, we won't talk about football or <laughs> any teams or anything like that. Um, but I have so many good friends from Cleveland, and, um, and it is really a great honor to be here and also to help you celebrate the 25th anniversary of Kelvin Smith Library. Um, this is a great opportunity to really, you know, under Arnold's leadership, just take, take stock of where you are and where you're going and think about those next 25 years. And I know um, Arnold won't be at the helm 25 years from now or even, I don't know, <laughs> five weeks from now, but I do want to congratulate Arnold for uh, such an amazing career, and um, I, I really value his counsel, and I remember when I was an um, associate university librarian at Michigan, and we were on a committee, and I just, you know, to me, Arnold was like that, he was that OG librarian. He just, he knew stuff. Like he just had experience and he'd been at Duke. And so I, I really look to people like Arnold um, for counsel and just reality checks because, you know, he's done so much. He's been at many places and it's just, you know, I'm just honored that he asked me to be here today. So thank you. And I, I wish you all the luck in your retirement. I, I already, you know, Arnold's already got trips booked and you know he's, he's ready um and i i um i really um think that um this opportunity that we have in our profession in the history of our country today to think about social justice to think about equity and inclusion is this is a once in a lifetime moment and so this is one of my favorite topics and so i'll i'll jump right in uh, but just to make sure arnold I'm going to wrap up at 5 o'clock, correct? Okay, so I'll make sure I wrap up before that so we have time for Q&A. Um, so I, I titled this Building the Future We Want because I do think that everything about diversity, equity, and inclusion is always about building a better future and what kind of community we want to have or and be, what kind of university we want to be. Universities are here to elevate human minds right? And you can't do that without diversity. Diversity is a core part of higher education, and it will forever be a core part. It's essential and critical to um, elevating human minds. So um, this is a topic that I think is just incredibly important um, at every level of a, of a higher education. And so today I'd like to cover these three areas. Um, and I would like to say that the next couple of slides are, um, I just wanted to give you a warning. They're very intense images that um, might trigger and be offensive to some of you, so just hold tight. Um, but I thought it was very important to just cover how is it that we're at this point today in this country. And I think it, it really begs us to think about the last 24 months um, as we think about um, where we're going. So how did we get here? Well, um, I use this slide from Charlottesville because when I was um, taking the helm at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, this was happening 
that same week, right? And so I was unpacking and, you know, Charlottesville is not that far from Chapel Hill. <laughs> it's, there, it's right up the street. And I was just horrified. And I just said, wow, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I already signed the contract. I was moved. I moved already. Um, and so there was no turning back. And I decided that, um, you know, I, I have to embrace the situation I'm in. And this event forever changed my life. And I think it, it forced me to completely rethink how I do my job and what it means to be a university librarian in the South, what it means to be an African-American female university librarian, and how I'm going to lead, not only at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but within the profession. Of course, um, we were all at home from the pandemic and watched what happened to George Floyd. This was, um, of course, a devastating event for our country. And I just remember watching it and then being compelled to write down a call to action to my organization. And so I wrote a letter to my organization after, um, I think it was May 30th or May 31st. And then it was published on June 1st. And I'll talk more about that, but I was just so distraught. I was so impacted and affected by what happened. And, and we all know all the things that happened after um, George Floyd was murdered. Um, we saw the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives, and, um, and millions of people all over the world walking and marching in the name of social justice. And at the same time, we are grappling with the pandemic of um, COVID-19. And so when I took this, this image, we were at 500,000 deaths, and now we're at about 700 and seven, almost 750,000 in this country. And what stands out is that many of these people did not have to die. The disproportionality of deaths is simply appalling. At one point in my home state of North Carolina, or my current state, 37% um, 30 per of infected related deaths were for African Americans who only represent about 20% of the population. And I can go on and on about how disproportionately um, African Americans, Hispanics, um, groups of people were impacted by this pandemic and it was completely preventable. The other item I wanna mention is the January 6th resurrection. Insur insurrection. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wish it were a resurrection. Um, and this is this event really forced me to think more deeply about democracy and what libraries are to democracy, and the threat that white supremacy is to democracy, and the, and democracy is a threat to white supremacy. And we saw this on January six, and it really forced me to, to double down on the role that libraries play in sustaining an informed citizenry um, that upholds our democracy. And we are educating the next group of citizens who we hope will sustain the democracy that we have. And then we all recall that um, the amount of hate that was directed at Asian and Asian Americans um, throughout the pandemic and the crimes against Asians and Asian Americans and how um, devastating this was to that community, but to, to all of us. And these are things that are still happening. Um, it's not happening at the same rate, but it still continues. And then the other thing I added is the um, great resignation. Um, we were talking at lunch, um, Joe, Jessica, Sam, Arnold and I, we were just talking about all the people who are resigning and, and, and what's going on in not just our profession, but just across um, the board. And how are we able to retain 
and recruit the best people. And there are so many reasons why people are, are leaving and, and rethinking their lives as a result of this pandemic. And this is going to, this could potentially create more inequities in our organization. Um, and it can also be an opportunity to address the inequities in our conversation. But I've had record numbers of retirements, and um, I don't know how I'm going to have people to actually do the jobs that need to get done. Um, so this is quite concerning, to, um, or should be concerning to all of us. So I wanted to cover some of the assumptions um, that I'm making, um, just to be clear that racism is everywhere. It's not a few bad apples, right? It is part of our society. I don't care what system you think about, whether it's criminal justice, education, healthcare, there is racism there, and we just have to accept that that's, um, that's there and not um, act as if there's just a few, like, because people want to think about one person, the individual, and reality is it's part of our systems and our structures, right? Um, and then I think the final part that is really important is when um, BIPOC um, staff and people we know are talking about those lived experiences, they should be appreciated and not discounted um, because they're real and um, they're part of the narrative which really could help you understand what does systemic racism look like, what does racism look like in your organization or, or, um, or otherwise. And that information is critical to help us understand what's going on. So um, how could libraries be responding to um, the, the world we live in and, and this um, systemic racism that has been um, part of our organizations um, for decades? And I also want to talk about the questions we should be asking ourselves. And so the first one is what's hampering in, um, inclusion, diversity in, in this work? And I'll often add accessibility. I think that's the like the final frontier of the work that we need to do with regard to inclusion. But um, we all know that for decades, our profession has claimed to be a profession dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I've been in the business for 25 years, and we always talked about it as if we were exemplars and we were doing it. And guess what? We're not. We were not addressing it systemically. We, we embraced checkbox diversity where we low hanging fruit, easy things that we could claim as victories when the reality is that we were just scratching the surface. And so these are the four things that are keeping us, that have kept us from truly addressing systemic um, racism, and not just racism, of course, but thinking about all the other forms of oppression. And the first one is just this false harmony, and that's the idea that we're not allowed to talk about obstacles or problems or challenges. And we're supposed to act as if everything's fine, right? <laughs> and we know everything's not fine. No, no organization is perfect, but we have to have the space to be able to point out what's not working. The second thing is neutrality. Uh, libraries are not neutral. Archives are not neutral. We make choices all the time. And when you want to act as if we're neutral, you're really undermining marginalized groups and erasing experiences. And so um, neutrality is, is different than um, partisan. It's different than, than some of the other words that people often use when they talk about libraries. Um, but I, I think that this is a, a challenge of you know both sides. Like we have to talk about both sides and things like that. And you, when you think about neutrality, you always have to think about neutral for whom and who holds the power to be neutral, right? The third one um, you've probably heard of from Fabazi Itar talking about vocational awe as if our profession is inherently good and um, and sacred. And that's um, just not true. <laughs> we are obviously subject to all the problems of our society. And the more we can embrace this idea that we have so much work to do and that um, we can't just sit back on our, our laurels and just say, well, we're, we're, we're good. We're, we're going to continue being good when that's just not true. And then finally, um, a person named um, Okun um, Tema 
talks a lot about white supremacy culture and how um, a lot of our organizations are very much um, dedicated to a culture of perfectionism, of paternalism, and, and a, a basic default way of doing business that does not serve everyone well. And, um, and at the end, I have a, a link to um, her uh, work, but I think it's really critical that um, we use some of these words. And I know words like um, white supremacy are powerful words, right? But I think we have to be very honest about what we're talking about here. So the second question is, um, is inclusive leadership a goal and is it important? And by inclusive leadership, I mean these three things. Um, and, and I could say um, that in my training, you know, I was never trained to be an inclusive leader. You know, I was trained to be a command and control leader, right? And that's, that's kind of how most of us are, are, are trained, right? Even in the home setting, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of six. And so I had um, middle managers called brothers and sisters, right? <laughs> and they, they very much believed in command and control, as did my parents. Um, and so I had to learn what this means to be an inclusive leader, and I'm still working on it. And it's like, well, how am I fair? And how do I make sure that I'm treating everyone not necessarily the same, because everybody doesn't need the same thing, but really trying to be equitable about what people want, what they need. And so the ability for people to belong and be valued and respected is really important. And I think we often make assumptions about that. And we're saying, oh, that person, they're, they're still working here. They come here every day. Therefore, they must feel like they belong and they feel valued. Eh, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> that is assumption you do not want to make. Just because people come to work every day does not mean that they um, have this sense of belonging. And then finally, and this is the big one, is are people supported and resourced for the work that they do and the t so that they can achieve their full potential? And that's a challenging one. I mean, none of us came in this profession to get rich, right? But we all want to be supported and resourced. And um, you know, our universities are stretched really thin and that's a challenge, but this is something that we have to be committed to and we have to work towards. The third and fourth question is um, about what are you doing as an organization um, in terms of the legacy, what has been done before you, and what continues to be done that perpetuates inequity? And what are you doing to examine the systemic raci racism and oppression and how it looks in your organization. And so I'm not saying that, you know, all of us get up in the morning and say, you know what, I want to perpetuate inequity. Like that's, you know, that's what I'm gonna do today. It doesn't work that way, right? It is built into the system and all you have to do is follow the policies, practices, and procedures, and you could be perpetuating inequity, right? So it's a much more complicated system than that. And so, um, this is what I wrote in one of my statements, um, like I said, in June 1st, when um, after the George Floyd murder. And we have to think about the systems in our um, libraries, metadata systems, the way we acquire materials, how do we invest our resources, our budgeting, our spaces? What pictures do we hang on a wall? Who do we privilege? Who's centered? All those things, what's highlighted, what's elevated, what's erased. These are the things that we have to be thinking about, systems. Um, and the number five, um, what steps are we gonna take to be an equitable and anti-racist organization? And so I make sure that I put this anti-racist organization second, because you can't be anti-racist organization if you are continuing to keep inequitable systems and structures in place. So you have to do both. Like you can't just jump over to be anti-racist. It's not possible to be anti-racist if you have these systems and you're not willing to interrogate them. So the third part is I want to talk about some of the examples of what I've done at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and think about um, what DEI, IDEA, whatever you want to call it, um, 
what that looks like and some of the ideas that we've worked on. Um, and I just want to be clear, um, a lot of stuff I'm making up, my staff were making it up on the fly. There's no handbook, just like there was no handbook for like um, how to run a library in a pandemic, like that book never existed. And, and doing this kind of systemic work, and, and I see head nodding, none of you have seen that book. On. And so the diversity work is the same way. You just don't have a, a distinct handbook that could tell you what to do and how and what and how it looks like. Um, and so, as um, I mentioned, um, I launched this reckoning initiative as a call to action because I wanted to be clear that we're going to do something. And many of us have gone down that path of book lists, um, book clubs. You know, we're all reading Ibram Kendi and and. Um, was it Robin D'Angelo and all these people? I mean, those books are, you know, these authors are, are becoming very wealthy off of these books that they've um, published. Um, but I, I was very um, intentional in calling it the Reckoning Initiative because it really is about accounting for who you are and what you've done. And I'm gonna look at my notes because I wanna make sure I read it exactly as I um, wrote it. And, um, and when we, when I launched this um, initiative, we then followed up with a reckoning initiative framework that's goal was to guide the university's library's efforts to address inequality and promote racial equity, inclusion, and anti-racism within our organization and through the work that we do. Uh, we will dismantle the individual, interpersonal, and organizational levers of systemic inequality. We will implement practices and policies that sustain equity, opportunity, and inclusive excellence. This shared framework empowers strategic action and coheres our efforts in support of a common direction. Now, this is very ambitious, right? Like, I'm surprised we just didn't put like fix climate change. I mean, this is this is hard, hard, hard stuff, right? And so just to go back to reckon is to account for what we, the university libraries, have done or have failed to do as an organization. Regardless of who was responsible for creating unjust, racist, or oppressive systems in the past, we as an organization will take responsibility for identifying and dismantling them. So the reckoning is an umbrella term that encompasses all activity dedicated to a variety of goals. Um, one of them is studying the past to understand what the university libraries has played, what role the libraries has played in and continues to play in upholding systems of oppression, exclusion, and inequity. Another example is increasing the diversity of library staff. Another one is uh, prioritizing accessibility. And another example of things that fall under this initiative is uh, being an engaged and active voice for racial equity, inclusion, and anti-racism work on campus, in the community, and in our professional organizations. Um, and I think it's important that reckoning is seen as transformative and not like a nice to have, it's strategic, right? And so it's a commitment, the commitment to racial equity and inclusion um, is our future. Right? It's not optional, it's not additive, it's not temporary, it is strategic. When we reframe our work through an equity lens, we fundamentally change how we approach every aspect. So um, for our framework for reckoning, we basically identified these five areas. And I put a checkbox next to education and training and programmatic work because I feel like this is what most of us are able to do. And from meeting with your um, working group today, I feel like you're already doing some really great work in this area. Um, but these are really the easy things, and they're not easy, right? I'll talk a little bit about the three, four, and five, which is really, really tough stuff that we have to get done. Um, so one of the things we released is our 21-day um, racial equity challenge syllabus. And what's great about this is what we focus on libraries. And there are lots of these racial equity challenges that are very general. And we cover topics from collections to surveillance, 
um, to find like everything we cover. Every, we try to touch every system in the library through this. So definitely check it out. We've released it under Creative Commons. Now programmatically, um, we funded this project where we are using machine learning to um, look at all the laws in North Carolina to understand which laws were Jim Crow. And this question came to us from, I think, a ninth grade teacher who called us and said, hey, do you, do you, can you help me find all the Jim Crow laws? And there are hundreds of laws. And of course, there's no book that says Jim Crow laws. Like, you have to do a lot of research. And so we, we set up a machine learning project. And um, it's been wildly successful. And um, we're seeking, uh, we got some funds from ARL. And we also chose to fund this project through our um, Ideas and Action Committee, which I'll talk about next. So one of the challenges with, with this type of work is there are no incentives or, or rewards for it. So I designated $250,000 to, um, to set up a grants program so that anybody was interested in doing any kind of work in this space could get the funding. So they can hire graduate students, undergraduate students, training, anything you need to get a project off the ground was funded. And so we set up a committee, set up, we set up um, information sessions, and the whole goal was to give out money. You know, it really wasn't a gotcha or anything. Like we really wanted to talk people through projects that we thought would be, um, some would be sustainable, but really things that would make a difference. Um, another thing um, we focused on is a, what we call our conscious editing. I don't know if there are any archivists out there. Um, I think I see Nora. Yeah, there's Nora. And, um, but we, we really have a um, legacy system because we, we, we basically have the largest archive of the American South. And we have these antebellum records which are filled with racist, um, offensive language and erasure. And so we have all these records of plantations and, and black bodies are completely erased. And we focus on the slaveholders and plantations and never on the enslaved people. So we're, um, we also funded this project to work. And this is the work, I mean, we're, we have millions and millions of manuscripts so, um, and records. So this is work that will not happen overnight. But we're very invested in looking at description of archives and historical materials, um, not just to um, be inclusive, but to also help our historians and others identify um, the materials that they're looking for. And if you're a historian, you're doing research on slavery, civil rights, all these things, it's very difficult because black bodies were largely erased. And so you have to dig in and dig in, and the finding aids do not adequately describe what's going on. All right, I have to move on pretty quickly. Um, so I already talked about, we check, checked off the, the education part and we checked off the programmatic work. And now the three things um, that are left are the systems work, integration, and the, the assessment and accountability. So I would say this is in progress. Um, and again, this goes back to, if you're looking at systems, you're looking at the truth and who you really are. Right, And so what you have to do is, we went through the exercise and we listed all the systems, HR, budget, finance, space, collections, all those things. And then when archives, we broke it down into appraisal, reference, and all those areas. And then we started gathering data. And so if we even looked at the HR system and hiring, for example, we could paint a picture of what's happening in our organization. Why is it that certain groups don't get hired? Why is it that certain groups are the lowest paid? Like we did that analysis and we had the data in front of us. So no one could say, oh, you're not, you don't have a problem. Yeah, there is a problem. Um, in our profession, there's a problem. There's a, there should be more um, librarians and library staff from underrepresented groups. It's not, it doesn't match the percentage in our population. Why is that? And so we go through this process for every system identify what's harmful, think about the power structures, what are the interventions, what's the future state, and, and how do we get there? And so we're doing this with um, a few areas, 
in our organization. Um, one of them is um, security, public safety, surveillance, and wellness. Um, this is something that keeps coming back, particularly right in the middle of the pandemic, um, about like <laughs> policing and, and who gets to enforce masks and all these fraught areas. Um, we felt like it was really important to dig in um, because we, we have typically had a security guard and a presence, um, but there's always been problems. And so we're looking into that. Um, but these are the five areas that we're committed to working on. One is pay and compensation. Um, that's a major problem at my organization. And so we're trying to figure out, well, what can we do um, to address this? What, what are the data telling us? I already mentioned safety, wellness, security, and policing. We have a task force working on that. Um, space, I mean, you're working on space too. I mean, that's a major area. And what we wanna do is literally take everything down, everything off the walls, and reimagine what space could look like. How could we work with artists, community groups, to rebuild our spaces and take down these dude walls that we have? Um, we have lots of these walls of people who look nothing like me. And lots of them are chancellors and provosts and things like that. But for students, and they come into these spaces and they see people that don't look like them, that it does not cultivate a, a belonging. The other area is recruitment and retention. Um, we talked about the great resignation. Um, and then finally, appointment and promotion is a big one. If, if you are not rewarding diversity equity work, and your people are coming up for promotion and appointment and we're not looking at that, that's a problem. And so we're going back to all of our policies and we have a committee that looks at every librarian when they come up from assistant librarian, to associate librarian, diversity has to be built into that system. So the other thing is about the integrating the practices. Um, this is a real capture of my organization. At the beginning of the Reckon Initiative, I asked people this question and you know, part of me, I just want to look at that bottom line. I'm like, what, like, one person, <laughs> more support from the university librarian. I was like, what is up with this? Um, but the reality is, people told me they didn't have the time. And, um, and that really started us down a path of saying, okay, what does this look like? Uh, what, what's the problem here? And I'll talk more about that. But really, if you want to integrate it, you can't be thinking of it as an additive extra thing, right? You have to reimagine your job. You have to think about your job differently. And we have goals for diversity within our performance management system. But hopefully in the next two years, we're not going to have that. Those goals are going to be baked in to your work, right? So they shouldn't be separate. They should be part and parcel of the, of the work you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it's these questions like, how do you um, center diversity in your work? Um, think about the systems that you work with day in and day out. If you're a cataloger, what systems are you using? If you're um, an archivist, if you're a reference librarian, what are the systems that you engage? Um, and then this is something that we really started to think about, about this time, like not having the time. That's a real legitimate concern. Like I don't want to minimize that. But I also want to push back and say, if you think that more time is going to, every, if we all have more time, we're going to become an anti-racist organization. That's just, that's just not true. Um, we have to change our mindset about diversity. And, and I think that's the biggest shift that we have to make. I also think that this idea that individuals single-handedly are going to change a system isn't going to work. It has to be. You have to examine the power structures and it has to happen at the group and organizational level. Um, abandoning your real job to focus on equity is not gonna get us anywhere. And then of course, we are not gonna depend or burden our BIPOC staff to do all this work for the organization. The final one, which I really think should be called a, accountability is um, how do you measure it? and because you can actually do harm. Like I'm interested in measuring the good and potentially the bad, right? Because <laughs> some sometimes the diversity work that's happening in organizations is actually harming the organization. And 
we have to be sure we're not doing that and that we're making a difference. And what the stories, we need data, we need qualitative information and quantitative information about the accountability and what impacts we could be making. So pulling it together, um, this is a test that a lot of organizations can take to determine how, you know, where are they on this intercultural development continuum. And most organizations are right in the middle. They minimize difference, right? Diversity is all about difference. But we spend all our time minimizing and saying, well, aren't we all the same? Like, let's not focus on what's different. Let's focus on the same. You know, we do that a lot. And to get, when you think of the broad level, you have to get to that adaptation adaptation stage where it is just built into who you are and what you represent. So what's the vision and strategy? How do you make it center? Um, I'm learning as I go. I've had to hire experts to help me out. And I spend a lot of time communicating what it is we're trying to do. Because I think the other part of this is if we're doing it for the sake of ourselves, like we should be doing it and our users should know it. They should see it and feel it. Our students, when they come in, the, in our spaces, our faculty, the staff, the communities we work with, should begin to see and know that we are an organization um, dedicated to inclusive excellence. And then it's all about our values. That's something I always talk about is values, value. This is who we are and we're very clear about what's important. And so setting these anti-racist goals is, is really hard, um, but it's critical that we go down this path and look at the policies, practices, and procedures and think about what kind of organization we're trying to be. So in conclusion, the thing you need more than anything, and it's not money, it's courage. Um, because money's not gonna save you. And you have to have the courage to step out and, and be uncomfortable, right? And be able to learn from each other. And also, um, you know, I really mean this point number three. This is the most rewarding work I've ever done, but it's also the most exhausting I've ever done. And I know that I aspire a lot. And I know you all aspire. And you're not going to get there on everything, right? So just be patient and keep at it and keep at it. Part of the process is supposed to be reparative. And then finally, I don't think we should ever lose sight of the goal. You know, like if I'm free, you're all free. Like it's really about freedom and liberation. It's not just about libraries, right? Like we have to think much more broader about this. So um, here's some resources. And I could actually, I realize this is the wrong slide. I could add more. But I just want to thank you for this opportunity. And I want to thank um, those of you I met with earlier with the working group. We had an energizing conversation. And I can't wait to follow up with, with you to, to learn where you're going. And I'm happy to share more about what we're doing. But I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to take your questions or comments. So thank you. Hello, Elaine. Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your wisdom with us and the great work that you're doing. Uh, and uh, certainly for being in the epicenter of all the things that happened uh, with Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm wondering about um, what additional strategies we can utilize when we've seen um, the cycles of history where there's a backlash to the very efforts of providing education, right? That's all the uproar about critical race theory and uh, and, you know, I was just thinking the other day is like, I wonder if, you know, as Reconstruction was contracting, whether it felt like this at that time, 
And was there something that could have been done differently? And I know that we're in a different place in history. So, you know, of course, I'm asking you to, to solve all of this. But the, the question is, what, what, what can we do when, when there's a sense of backlash? Where can we make, we make headway, particularly through library systems and those of us who endeavor to educate our communities? Thank you. Well, um, thank you. That first question was just an easy pop-up, right? <laughs> that just eased me in. No, that's, I mean, that's the million-dollar question. And I think what I could say is, to me, this is a, this is a marathon. And these backlashes are cyclical. They, they, democracy, we have to fight for it. And we have to fight for social justice. And, um, I would say it's all about educating ourselves, understanding the issues, the courage and commitment and conviction. And that's it. I mean, that's evergreen. You have to realize that there's a price for speaking out. There's a price that has to be paid. But our democracy is on the line. And um, and I think so is our humanity. And... And I think the work that you're doing, and we talked about this earlier today, is whether it's racial equity work, social justice work, accessibility, um, you know, we have a commitment to, to think about oppression and what we're doing to alleviate that and human suffering. And I think that's, that's a tall order. And, and so I would say just keep doing it keep working, keep committing to it. And, and that's it. I mean, it's like, I'm in it for the long haul. And, um, and it's rewarding work and it's difficult work at the same time. And it's like, I, you know, I don't want to get up every morning and put my armor on and fight. fight. <laughs> that gets exhausting. But I do think it's important to be very clear on what's important and value of, of value to you. Like I was just talking about you know, just with collections, like I just said, I will never sign a, a non-disclosure agreement, confidentiality clause ever again. That's a value that is extremely easy for me to follow. Now it's made us walk away from some really important resources, but I had no problem going to the chemistry department or the medical school and saying, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I don't care what resources is. <laughs> You have to figure out a way, and we're gonna put pressure on these publishers um, who don't care about accessibility, but I said that I wasn't gonna do this and I'm gonna keep my word. And when you have those values, the decisions you make are very easy. They might not be received easily, <laughs> um, but it, as a leader, it makes my life easier to basically just draw that line in the sand and say, this is it. There's another question there. Thanks for a really stimulating talk. Uh, I may be the only faculty member here. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm the only one. Uh, I'm, I'm the faculty member. Uh, my name's Ken Ledford. I'm from the Department of History, uh, and we'll see each other Tell later. I'm, I'm a member of the Friends of the Library, oh, uh, among wonderful. other things. So, But I'm a Germanist. Um, and I do wonder, on the larger level, and this transcends libraries as particular institutions with their own particular uh, folkways of how to do these sorts of things, whether some international comparison might in fact be useful. And this is something I've thought a lot about since Charlottesville, and I gave a Constitution Day address about it, because I do the history of Germany, which is a place that has had to come to grips with its own past in important ways and think of structures and systems to eradicate some of the systemic evils that led to what they were first forced to realize was a disaster at, by conquest and occupation, but then second, embraced. And we've had a lot of these structures ourselves in the peculiar and chaotic um, federalist structure of the United States. But in Germany, they created in the 1950s, both at the state levels and at the national level, 
uh, or st state run or state funded, but not state run organizations that transcended political party. But they were centers for civic education, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung and the Landeszentralen für politische Bildung. And these were consciously to teach students as citizens what it is to not have the kinds of racialized and hostile thoughts toward Slavs, Jews, uh, Sinti and Roma, and black people um, that ultimately culminated in the disaster of uh, 33 to 45. Now we've had those, but they've been things like the Texas School Book Commission, uh, the School Book Commissions in many states, and we've gotten a political or civic education, but it's been the wrong one. I just finished Karen Cox's book that uh, UNC Press published, which tells the story very clearly. Um, so what can we all do as universities, as elements within the university, either ourselves or through state action, to encourage a, a society-wide coming to grips with this systemic race racism that we want to deny by attributing it to the bad actions of individuals. All right, that's another really easy question there. <laughs> well, I would say, Professor, that, um, you know, I really appreciate the, the German context you provided because I do know that um, people have looked at reparations and the Holocaust and what done in Germany and how you don't have monuments to Nazi sympathizers in Germany like we do here to Confederate um, generals who um, who were involved in a treasonous insurrection, right, called the Civil War. So I do, th I wish we would look at that more. Um, I had the opportunity to um, talk with Sandy Darity and there was another panelist who basically was an expert in um, German, um, the reparations at the German government. And that was very enlightening. And I think we're not looking to that. I also think what's going on in Canada and their work with indigenous groups is also irrelevant because this is a global struggle. It's a definitely a global struggle. And I think that um, there's so many great work that's going on and we just I, I think fundamentally we we don't want to tell the truth and even my own organization we struggle with, I mean just the simple you know this the university I work with was built by enslaved people students brought their slaves to campus right and they were basically leased out to the campus to do work I mean that's a reality and it's very difficult to people to even acknowledge that. And the, the history of slavery and, and the relationship to the university, I mean, it's, we just don't like to be uncomfortable and we want to, we want to swim in diversity and equity and inclusion, but we just don't want to get wet. And I think that's fundamentally the rub that we're seeing um, across this country and it's just, um, you know, I love Karen Cox's book and, um, you know, I've had my own share of work with the Confederate monuments and uh, renaming buildings and just having that conversation. And you're a historian, like explain this is memory and this is history. These are not the same thing. And trying to get people to understand the difference and why we don't want to um memorize or we don't want to have these monuments to remember treasonous um, insurrectionists, right? Like that's why we have monuments. That's why we have holidays. That's why we have these things because we want to remember. And this is not erasing history when you take down a monument, right? And so I just feel like our education system has not um, served us well. Our textbooks are flawed. Some of the textbooks in the South are appalling. Just in my state, the textbooks and how they teach North Carolina history, it's appalling the lies that are, are in these in these books. And we see a growth in banned books right now, and particularly in Texas. So I don't think I'm truly answering your question, but um, I hope to, you know, um, talk with you more about that and hear your thoughts and and um, 
you know, we're at an institution of higher learning. There's, there are amazing scholars here at this university as well as my own. And it's a, it's a shame that this intellectual capital doesn't seem to be um, making the impression on our electorate as it should. So I'll end there. Do we have Joe? We, we're out of time. I was going to see if Joe. Okay, no, Joe. We have time for one more. Just real quick. You know, North Carolina is a North Carolina was in 1980, right? But still, I know that there's still a lot of it's, it's Southern University. What was the pushback with your initiatives, which are quite impressive? Okay, I'll repeat the question just for the recording. So what's the pushback with the Reckoning Initiative, uh, given the political state of North Carolina? Um, I guess I would say that... Um, that I don't know if um, if the work that I'm doing is widely known, and I'm deeply committed to it, um, no matter what. And I, I would say, even with within my organization, I could say that everyone at my library has not fully embraced the Wrecking Initiative. That's a fact. Um, but I'm committed to it, and I think it's our values, and I'm going to continue. And I think that's what's most important. And we have a set of constituents in our community, the state of North Carolina, and our students. So I'm not just thinking about the library staff, but what we mean to the state as well as the, the faculty and the students. And the feedback I'm getting from the faculty is very positive. And I... Um, I do get negative feedback, and as I had said earlier, you know, on good days, you know, it's people who don't really want to engage, and on bad days, I, I refer to them as haters. But at the end of the day, I focus on the people who truly want to live up to these values, and the people in the middle ground who kind of on the fence, they're, they sort of want to engage, but the people who don't, who actively disengage from this conversation or are not tolerant or um, are actively um, promoting ideas like you know racist ideas, sexist, um, transphobic, things like that. Um, I don't worry about that. I really don't. Like I have to focus my energies on the people who want to create a better world and want to um, change our profession, which to me has gotten a little milk toast and just really, complacent and this call to action I think is real we have to work in our societies and our associations American Library Association Law Library Association Medical Library Association we need to see more change in those organizations as well as the curriculum and our library programs because I don't think they're preparing our students to be in a multiracial society um, and that's what we need more than anything I put my email address and Twitter up there just in case um, you want to reach me that way. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>